Hi, this is lecture video on Newton's third law. You might already have heard of Newton's third law or a version of it anyway, but I think the version that most people have heard is more confusing than helpful. So this is the version that a lot of people have heard. For every action, there is equal and opposite reaction. And that's uh, unfortunate because I think for most people, this statement actually causes more confusion than illumination. This is what I mean. Take these other statements that you may have heard elsewhere. Um, what goes around comes around. Or maybe there is no smoke without fire. Or just a phrase, cause and effect. There is a one thing that doesn't belong in this group, and that's the very first statement, Newton's third law. That's what I mean, this statement causes more confusion than illumination. If, uh, as I was listing those other proverbs or maxims, if it felt to you like I was describing the same thing as Newton's third law, I was not. This phrasing of action and reaction is really open to that misunderstanding. You hear the word uh, reaction and you think of the verb react, which makes you think the reaction is a result of action. And I'm here to tell you that all these implications are false. None of these are meant when someone says for every action there is equal and opposite reaction. So to make it extra clear, all these statements which may have seemed to you similar to what Newton's third law says, well, these are principles in life. I'm not saying they are wrong, but they have nothing to do with the Newton's third law. That's what I want to point out before we start talking about what Newton's third law does really mean. So what I would really like to do is first, let's do away with this phrasing that causes more confusion than help. And let me state the mechanics of Newton's third law in a way that it won't be confused for other things. It's more cumbersome, longer way to state it, but people have been confused about Newton's third law often and long enough that I think this extra time is worth it. So this is how I would like to state it. For every force, A exerts on B. B exerts a force on A. And these two forces are equal in magnitude and opposite in directions. It's a bit of a mouthful, so let me draw a diagram. So let's say we have two objects, A and B, and they interact with each other, maybe pushing and pulling, maybe there are magnets on them, who knows. Let's say they are pushing. And if there's a force on B by A, what Newton's third law says is there must be a force on A and this force is by B and they must be equal in magnitude and opposite in directions. So the very first thing to note about Newton's third law is it involves two bodies interacting. So I like to call Newton's third law law of interaction. It serves as a first check on if you have understood the third law correctly. If you are not involving some interaction between two different bodies, then you are not understanding Newton's third law correctly. And it's in this context where we can properly define the terms action and reaction. If you call one of these two forces action or action force, then the other force in this pair is the reaction or reaction force. And the biggest thing I want you to see here is the symmetry in this interaction. Action force and reaction force, there's no difference between them whatsoever. If this action force was a contact force, if A pushed on B by normal force, then the reaction force is also going to be contact force, normal force on A by B. And in fact, this symmetry is so complete, we can do this. We can swap the labels around. So if you correctly identify the action and reaction force, 
that's what you're going to see. That if you swap the labels around, that those swapped labels should still make sense. This ensures that you haven't mistaken the in relationship between action force and reaction force as being a relationship between a cause and effect or cause and result kind of a relationship because they are not. All right, let me illustrate this to you with some examples. So this is a simulation software where I can simulate things. I can create objects in here and I can have these objects interact with each other. Let me give one of these two boxes some velocity. And when I start the simulation, that's what you see. All right, let me do a couple things that's going to make things easier for me. I'm going to make these boxes frictionless and elastic. It makes them ideal in some sense. It makes the descriptions easier. And let me slow down the simulation speed so that I have some time to talk. All right, double check that one of these boxes have some initial velocity, so they move. And let me run the simulation. You've seen this before. Box slides to right, strikes, and then stops. And it's this interaction that I want you to think through. As box A strikes box B, box B speeds away because there was a force on box B pushing it to the right. And at the same time that's happening, box A is slowing down. Watch again. And that's because box A is being pushed to the left. So what Newton's third law is describing are the forces at this moment of interaction. So it says as A pushes B to right, B pushes on A to the left. And this is the result you see. And this relationship holds even when some parameters are different. Let's say, for example, let's make A heavier. I think the simulation keeps the density the same, so I'll make A twice as big as B, or close enough. And we run the simulation, and let's see what happens. Huh. So this time, A didn't come to a stop, and there is a reason for that. The force pushing B is equal in magnitude to the force pushing A. But because of Newton's second law, the thing with the heavier mass will have lower acceleration. So whereas before A came to a complete stop, this time A doesn't come to a complete stop. Let me flip this around. This time I'm going to have A smaller than B. Let's see what happens then. So by smaller I mean less mass. Now this time, you see A bouncing off of B, going backward. And the reason for this is the same as before. With the equal magnitude of the force that the B is being pushed by, A is also being pushed. But because its mass is smaller, it undergoes greater acceleration, and it results in A bouncing back. So later in the course, you are going to see this exact same scenario described in terms of something we call momentum. But I wanted to show this to you now so that you can see we can analyze this just using Newton's third law. And in fact, when we introduce momentum, you will see the intimate connection between Newton's third law and momentum. All right, so that's the explanation of Newton's third law. Let me end this with a fun example, just so that you can see an extended series of interactions. Let me bring back the simulation, um, start a new screen. And this time what I want to do is I want to create a big box. Uh, let me give this box the same properties as before, frictionless and elastic. And I want to make it a little bit heavier, I have my own reasons. So let me make it much heavier. And I need a little dot living inside the big box. Let the simulation run for a little bit. And give the dot same property as the big box. 
elastic and frictionless and let me give it a little speed to the right and let's let the simulation run and see what happens so as this ball bounces back and forth I hope you see Newton's third law acting in this scenario that as the ball bounces back and forth called the force on the ball that makes this happen the action force there is a reaction force on the box around it that's causing the box to move forward a little bit. So it moves forward here, and then it gets stopped here, and then it moves forward again, and so on. So that's all. As I keep repeating, Newton's third law is the most misunderstood of Newton's laws. If you have understood this correctly, that itself is a significant achievement. That will help uh, those of you who are going on to Physics 4A. And I guess those of you who are not going on to Physics 4A, I'm not sure what you will use this for. But until next time, bye.